is essentially fixed, uh, you know, in this model, uh, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's um, Brian Green with an E on the end of it. Um, but in this particular, uh, I, th I think it's this video, if, if I'm right in picking it, I haven't looked at it for a while. He explains that there's lots of possible universes that could have existed. They're, they're, uh, they might actually all exist in, in a multiverse. He refers to it not as simply a universe, but as a multiverse. Um, and the, um, the difference between our universe and all the other universes is just a small very small, so he, he, he does the thing where he's got all the decimal points all over, and it's like three columns of decimal, and, and that's the only difference between our universe and the other universes as they go, uh, and that relates to how much dark matter is in the universe and so on, and it's a hypothetical uh, um, uh, formula that basically explains why we have planets, why we have suns, why we have uh, those kinds of, of supernovas and things of that sort. If it hadn't been for the exact calculations that set up our particular universe, we wouldn't have the kinds of, of, of uh, environments that enable life, uh, for example, and, and enable us to have an atmosphere and, and water and, and basically we wouldn't exist. If, that exact amount of energy was set the way it was in our particular universe. And so in all of the other universes, life doesn't exist. Uh, and in that sense, this is the best of all possible universes because we, we wouldn't have life, etc., if we were in any of those other universes. Uh, only in this one do we have life. But does that mean that everybody has a peachy keen all their life? No. You know, that's not what Leibniz was talking about, I think. Instead, he was basically arguing that if what we say about God is correct, this must be the best possible universe. And so Voltaire didn't get the point. Well, of course, Voltaire might not have cared about getting the point. He might have just wanted to make sure he had a popular hit on his hands. Uh, remember how he talked to Rousseau, say what everybody thinks say so just the opposite of what everybody thinks and, and you'll be popular. I imagine he did the same thing. Who knows? In any case, um, so that critique of Leibniz uh, is, is kind of a mistake, I think. So let me move on. I, it's, it's so hard to move on from Leibniz, but we really should be talking more about Barclay today. And by the way, it's pronounced Barclay. How would you pronounce that? Berkeley, probably. So Barclay uh, is how it was pronounced at the time. And if you go to the University of Yale, where there is a college called Barclay College, that's how they pronounce it. But if you go to another uh, university named in his honor, and that's at the University of California, Berkeley, Berkeley there is pronounced Berkeley, yes? You probably all have heard it. Uh, they even have a Lawrence Berkeley Labs, which is no relation uh, to uh, George Berkeley. Totally different, different honorarium for an actual physicist named Lawrence Berkeley. However, um, uh, why are those uh, uh, places named in his honor? What did he do uh, that, uh, that earned that for him? Well, uh, as a relatively young man, uh, he, and by the way, he was a, a good friend of the author of Gulliver's Travels. Uh, anybody remember who, who that is? Jonathan Swift, right? Um, yes, Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels. Jonathan Swift and he were good friends. And in fact, it was his nobleman that enabled him, Jonathan Swift, to publish his books that he was able to get uh, Barclay's first book published and other books as well. Um, his first book, by the way, was uh, an, essay, an essay towards a new theory of vision, uh, where he 
apparently is the one who invented the idea of, of why it is we can tell distance, and that's because we have two eyes that give us a stereoscopic view of things. So mathematically, it enables us to figure out where things are. And yet, by the way, he argued that there is no actual distance, that, we, that you can't actually see distance. Uh, instead, it's, um, it's all an idea that we receive in our minds as a result of our perceptions of things, which are all ideas. I, I think I, I started the argument he gives us uh, in, uh, in last class that his big concern was the materialism of John Locke, which leads us to think that God only needs to have created the universe and then just rested on his or her laurels. He doesn't have to do anything else to maintain it because he would have made it in such a perfect way that uh, you don't need to c complete, come in and reset the clock every once in a while. The machine is perfect, right? And so you don't need God for anything really other than the fact that it's here. And he was convinced that that's going to lead people to no longer believe in God or, or, or listen to uh, you know, the church or anything. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced he's right about that. The more people that are persuaded by that, uh, especially in Northern Europe, you can see it, they, they become nuns. Uh, nuns in the sense of N-O-N-E. They don't have a religion anymore. Or they might even say they're atheists, although uh, you know, the interesting thing about an atheist is, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, an atheist means you don't you, you literally say there's no God. And of course, you can't prove a negative, so to speak, right? So you can't prove that God doesn't exist. Uh, generally speaking, the, the atheists that I'm familiar with like things like uh, uh, the uh, uh, flying spaghetti monster. You guys all familiar with that? You know, that's, they're just trying to ridicule the idea that there's some sort of creature out there. We can invent a flying spaghetti monster, which, by the way, you can't prove it doesn't exist <laughs> as far as they know. <laughs> that somewhere in the universe there's a flying spaghetti monster. You ever seen it? It's cute looking. It, I, I, I used it as my Facebook icon once uh, for fun. Um, it's just so silly. Um, so his concern was this material uh, uh, point of view is it's going to lead people away from God, belief in God, need for God, and at the same time, if you examine it, you discover that it's completely self-contradictory, because uh, the grounds he, that, that John Locke gives us for believing in this material substance um, uh, is that your primary qualities, which are the ways you know how big or how hard or whatever these primary qualities are, these, these substances, this, this material is, are based on your secondary qualities, which are the ways we can sense things in the world. And our secondary qualities are the ways that we see and hear and taste, and, et cetera, all, you know, all the senses that enable us to know that those primary qualities are out there. We can't actually see the primary qualities themselves. All we can actually know are the secondary qualities, which are the perceptions that we have in our mind, right? And so as a result, you can't actually ever know uh, the characteristic of the thing in itself, what those things out there are. Uh, and as a result of that, you end up with this skepticism that there's no way for us to actually know the world as it is. And that wouldn't be just with regard to objects. It would also, in a sense, also be with regard to what's true. It will be, it will be a matter of everybody's perspective, what's true to you. And that means that there's no objective truth out there that everybody must eventually come to believe in. Um, and you do get folks like, uh, later on, you'll have Charles Sanders Peirce who's an American philosopher um, from about the time of the Civil War. And he argues that even though we can never actually know what things are out there objectively, we keep coming closer and closer by the way we study it so that we're never actually going to know the thing in itself 
but we're all going to move in that direction by kind of a trial, uh, uh, you know, test and trial uh, method, the scientific method, right? Um, but so anyway, his explanation for the persistence of things that are out there is the mind of God, and we have have this, uh, which one is to pick, which one should I pick? So God in the quad. And, and by the way, that brings me to today's quiz question, if you're curious. I won't forget it today. Um, if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? How many of you have heard that one before? Uh, in fact, I'm convinced if I didn't give you that quiz question in this class, this intro class, you would have had the right to go to the university and demand your money back. That's how absolutely essential that question is to an intro to philosophy course. And where does this whole idea come from? Well, here's the limerick. I'll, I'll read it because it's so small here. Um, let me see if I can. There was a young man who said, God must find it exceedingly odd to think that the tree should continue to be when there's no one about in the quad. Reply. I, I always feel like I should do this in a deeper voice for some reason. I don't know. Sound like Zeus, maybe. Dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always about in the quad, and that's why the tree continue will continue to be. I, I've always heard continues to be. Since observed by yours faithfully, God. By the way, there's a second uh, portion of this. This uh, was written by Knox, this, this limerick, uh, K-N-O-X, uh, not, not the same one that uh, gives us, um, uh, I thought it said here somewhere, a Knox limerick. Um, boy, this is a slow page to, to work with, but here's the, no, come back, come back, come back, come back. Shoot. a sec. Oh, okay. Where am I? You want to hear the second part? Did I lose it? I lost it. Well, there's a second, second part of the poem that I can't get to because this is Anybody else find it? You could quote it if you found it. I lost it. Oh, well. But there's a sec second part. Maybe it's on this one. Oh, yeah. Here we go. I don't know why they have Descartes on this page. But so and there's no one about in the quad, etc. So the second part, if objects depend on our seeing... So the trees unobserved would cease treeing. Then my question is, who is the one who sees you and assures your persistence in being? Dear sir, you reason most oddly to bees to be seen for the bodily, but for spirits like me to be is to see. Sincerely, the one who is godly. So that's just cute. And, and of course... You know, when you're thinking about the question and you're going to answer it, my my first thought is, well, if you're if you're taking your cue from the model of the universe by John Locke, you'll uh, probably want to say, of course, the tree makes a sound, because uh, even if I'm not there seeing it, the tree falling in the woods is going to make a, a crash uh, that will 
uh, create a sound wave. So even if I'm not there, the sound is there, right? Uh, a second answer would be Barclay's answer, and I think that one is that, well, God is the one that continues to see or hear the tree crashing in the woods, even if none of us are there. And so the reason for the persistence of nature is not material, as Locke would say, but it instead is God. That's what makes pers the universe persistent, is God's mind, right? Um, and then the third one that I can think of will be when we discuss David Hume, who will say, what tree? 